Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're delighted you're here. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, there's another show up on Capitol Hill that might be related to this one in some ways, but we're delighted you've picked this one instead of that one. So thanks so much for being here. Um, it's my very uh, great privilege and high honor to be able to introduce General Clapper today um, to talk a little bit about eyesight uh, and the, both the past and the present in the integration of the IC. As it happens, I was extraordinarily privileged over the course of my career to cross paths with Jim in several different uh, instances. These occurred when um, he was leading change in the IC, reshaping the environment in which we all worked. And even though I was not involved necessarily in some of the agencies that um, he was working in at the moment, um, we still had some opportunities to interact together. I needn't dwell on the um, unparalleled record of national leadership. Director DIA, Director NEMA, transforming it into NGA, USDI, and finally DNI. In every case, and in between these assignments, he has sought to improve the nation's intelligence capabilities to inform better mission outcomes for the IC's customers. I'd like to spend just a few minutes recounting the events I witnessed in which Jim personally led the change for integration and improvements of the IC. These demonstrate his focus not only on technology and operations, but the often intangible and difficult issues of policy, culture change, and organizational transformation and renewal. The first of these was at the end of the 90s and coming into 2000, when he was between government jobs and was working in the private sector. During this period, Jim was on the NSA advisory board. He developed a major study of the future of the SIGINT system in response to a request from one of the congressional committees. He introduced the study by saying, you asked me the time, but then he went into laborious detail to describe actually how to build the watch. He commandeered one of the small conference rooms in the NSA Advisory Board suite at, at NSA and spent months working essentially full-time on the task. My team was dealing with some uh, SIGINT mission management issues at the time, and we had a number of very fruitful and positive discussions and exchanges with Jim. It's characteristic of him that he spent so much time and effort trying to recognize and, and recommend ways to improve one of the major pillars of the intelligence community. The second occasion began in 2001 when Jim was director of NEMA and he and General Hayden pushed to integrate SIGINT and IMINT. You might assume that everyone would welcome this, a major strengthening of the nation's intelligence capabilities. But the cultural and policy changes were tough, from integrating NEMA personnel into NSA and allowing their use of NSA networks, to the issuance of a single product series with the joint so-called kissing logos at the top of the product. Jim led the effort to address and resolve those challenges, and they were all culture and, and process, um, not technology. Finally, in 2008, as USDI, Jim joined with Don Kerr, who had recently moved from leading the NRO to serving as PDDNI, and General Alexander at NSA to work with DNI McConnell to establish the Information Integration Program, the I2P. Um, they asked me to move from NSA to lead the activity, which was, of course, an extraordinary opportunity for me. Although the ODNI was not new at this point, its authorities were still untested in many ways. And we all recognized that there would be various kinds of resistance from the agencies to actions directed too much by the ODNI. And of course, the linkage between the DNI and USDI was still being developed. It's even a bit of a challenge today in some cases. We decided to rely on the agency CIOs and a senior officer from USDI as the core decision team. Jim's support in the form of USDI participation and input was absolutely crucial to confirming and defining the path that we were trying to identify. To define, to function with robust processes and the required openness, we had first to build a governance framework to make decisions across the IC and the USDI. We also developed an integrated architecture and map capabilities from the architecture into a program plan that identified funding for the development and acquisition of agreed upon capabilities, in some cases as joint efforts with the agencies and ODNI. With DNI McConnell's strong support, we addressed information sharing policy issues, working with David Shedd on ICD 501 implementations and processes as he pushed that milestone policy to completion. 
Jim Clapper's support was critical in this process since some of the most intractable information sharing issues arose from the desire to access and share information derived from sensitive military sources. While the I2P was essentially the first IC-wide information integration program, it was in many ways just a first step. Many of the I2P's objectives, principles, and processes, however, have been passed on to iSight. In fact, I talked to Al Tarasic shortly after he had taken over the CIO job at the ODNI, and I asked him what he was going to start with, and he said, we're going to restart I2P. He was, of course, a central participant and one of, the, one of the major pillars of what we had been able to do. What I2P really needed at that point to grow into full-scale, broad IC integration, what we think of as iSight today, was a committed visionary and strong leadership, a champion with a long-term view of the issues in the DNI's chair. And, of course, this leadership had arrived with Jim's appointment as DNI in 2010. Under the DNI's leadership, there's been great progress, despite the fact that change in the government can be slow and difficult, as Jim will admit. Most significant is the will to act and use the DNI's authority to bring the community together. We see this in the landmark decision to establish community clouds as information spaces, C2S and GovCloud, both partnering with, with industry and expanding the use of government capabilities and in the more recent cloud license agreement with Oracle, presumed to be the first of many. The DNI and the principal deputy, uh, Stephanie O'Sullivan, have said, in effect, that the agencies should act as one and should be treated as one, with all the significant benefits that result from the common standards and architectures and the greater sharing of resources. This will lead to greater flexibility and agility in information sharing, management and security, and greater transparency and consistency in preserving our cherished civil liberties and personal freedoms. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my very deep honor and high privilege to present to you, without further ado, the DNI, Jim Clapper. Well, thank you, uh, Press, for uh, a great introduction, and uh, I very much appreciate that. Uh, Press was, at the time uh, when I was on the NSA Advisory Board, um, you know, one of those uh, change agents that uh, you, you, you see after time in any organization, <coughs> and uh, he was uh, a great ally. Um, and the study in question, of course, was occasioned by, in the 90s, the <clears throat> concerned by many, which I think was uh, somewhat misplaced, but anyway, uh, the Congress was uh, captured by this, that somehow uh, NSA was failing to recognize the uh, import and impact of the Internet and all that that <clears throat> connoted for uh, uh, the, the SIGINT business. <clears throat> and um, I know I understand this myself. As, hard to get away from good old high-frequency manual Morse, uh, which dominated so much of the SIGINT business when uh, I was a young pup in the 60s and 70s. But uh, as, as we've seen since, uh, NSA is clearly overachieved uh, in the internet. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I, I can't help but uh, commend uh, the leadership of ENSA, uh, Joe and Chuck and others, for um, as I was checking in my coat at Spadero and Associates, and so <laughs> I think it's, uh, you know, the lengths that INSA will go to to try to take care of industry, I think is, uh, yeah, it's really commendable. Um, <clears throat> the li my line here was going to be that, uh, I mean, I did mention this at the Fall Symposium, that I'm somewhat of a uh, INSA hipster. And just before I came in here, uh, Chuck produced on his cell phone a uh, terrible picture of me in a ridiculous plaid sport coat. Uh, I can't imagine uh, my mommy let me out of the house with this thing, but somehow Insa had a picture. I think this goes back to uh, way back when, maybe when I was director of DIA, so over 20 years ago, and it's huge glasses. I, what, what, what was I thinking? Anyway, so living proof, I guess I was in fact a, 
a hipster, and I, I was into, you know, into in, INSA before it was INSA. And, uh, and I, I did serve briefly in a year and a half or two as uh, president of uh, SASA, which was the uh, predecessor to INSA. And one of the things I learned then is how critical uh, it is to the IC mission, and I can say this because at the time I was in, in industry, uh, to bring together government industry people from across uh, the intelligence enterprise and throughout its history of this organization, that has been um, a great strength, uh, a great attribute of, of INSA. So once again, uh, I appreciate uh, the in invitation to uh, close out the symposium today while you're closing out your lunches. Um, so we started this morning by uh, discussing the now uh, 10-year-old IRTPA legislation, which gave birth to uh, the ODNI, and, 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 and in fact, I think, inspired the creation of INSA from SASA. So both of our organizations are, are turning 10 this year, uh, ODNI and uh, next month, and uh, INSA in November. So I think turning 10, uh, you know, when you have a 10-year thing, it gives you a good reason to, to look back. Uh, which is what, precisely what I think you've done uh, this morning. Senator Susan Collins uh, was here this morning to talk about the origins uh, of our organizations. Uh, and, ten and, half, and of course, as you all know, ten and a half years ago, she and Senator Lieberman were you know, kind of the uh, godmother, godfather, if you will, uh, introduced the bill on the floor of the Senate that would, be, that would later become the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism and Prevention Act of 2004 which President Bush signed into law on the 17th of December, 2004. And, uh, you know, the ODNI stood up uh, in April of 2004, so now we're approaching our 10 years. Susan quoted a mother who had lost a son as a result of the 9-11 attacks. And I think uh, the quote that she rendered this morning bears repeating. And I quote, when, America, when American lives are at stake, inaction because of inertia is unacceptable. And that applied uh, in 2001, and it applies uh, today. It's still very apt. Now, IRTPA, like all major legislation, um, as uh, Michael Allen so wonderfully documented in his book, is a result of compromise, and so as a consequence, like any major legislation, it has its flaws. In fact, it overachieves at being flawed. Uh, but nevertheless, it established the ODNI and statute and, and, and set the impetus for the creation of, of INSA. And that's you know, the beginning, uh, the origin of the story that uh, brought us here this afternoon. And so I think the way the symposium, uh, this symposium has been organized is as kind of a narrative of uh, intelligence reform over the past decade. So she started uh, with the IRTPA, <clears throat> and then John Negroponte, Mike McConnell, and Dennis Blair talked about their tenures as DNI. And as I understand it, variously said that DNI should be a manager or a coordinator or a leader and someone quoted General Powell saying it needed to be an empowered quarterback. And I would observe that based on my four and a half plus years, uh, it's all, all the above. Uh, you have to be, play all those roles and play those distinct roles in different situations. Uh, I don't think there is a single uh, you know, a noun to describe uh, you know, the total the potential uh, reactions and the potential behavior of the DNI. You're all those things. So anyway, I guess now it's my turn to talk a bit about my perspective and about the direction uh, that we're headed. And I, I think the journey um, of the past has been one of integration. Uh, I believe that was the 9-11 Commission's goal, which was simply instantiated or memorialized by the IRTPA legislation. And that uh, you know the mandate really was to act as an integrated uh, community, and I always felt that's what the commissioners wanted, and that the Congress, at least saluted, uh, was integration. 
So when I became DNI, I thought ODNI needed to set the example uh, to pro promote a culture of integration. Uh, you know, I really think that's the reason why we have a DNI. It is to promote the culture uh, of intelligence integration, wherein integration becomes the ex instinctive default behavior as opposed to dictating it as an afterthought. Or, or said another way, well, we'll do our thing over here, and then uh, you know, if we have to, we'll do integration. It, it, should, it should be the other way around. So in the highest traditions of setting the example, uh, about four and a half years ago, um, what I started at ODNI itself was to crash together collection and analysis into a, a single organization. So we went from having four deputy DNIs to just one, the, the, the deputy director of national intelligence for intelligence integration. Uh, first incumbent, Robert Cardillo, now director of NGA, and now uh, Mike Dempsey. And uh, the reason I felt strongly about it, has, having observed ODNI since its stand up, and particularly when I served as USDI, I thought that uh, a consistent organizational template um, with the National Intelligence Managers 4 construct was the right thing to do with their accompanying unifying intelligence strategies to focus, to focus collection and analysis efforts on uh, specific IC mission sets. And a lot of people at the time said they thought this was, as they always do when you reorganize, it's a radical uh, restructure, it really wasn't. All I was doing was building on what my predecessors had done. In fact, John, John Negropani named the first country-specific mission managers in January of 2006 in ODNI's first year. And checking my notes, these two people were Leslie Ireland as the mission manager for, Ar for Ar Iran, who's here today, now the head of the Department of Treasury's intelligence component as Treasury's INA, and she wears a second hat as the National Intelligence Manager, manager or NIM, for threat finance. And the other was a young man, many of you know, Joe Detrani was the mission manager for North Korea. Now, you know, young is a relative term, but for me, just about every living soul is young. So, <laughs> so while I'm on that point, it, I do think it says something about the dynamic of our two organizations that INSA's chairman of the board and president are both ODNI plank holders. And also I want to note that the next time we need someone to go to North Korea, we probably ought to send Joe. Um, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to get invited back. But back to ODNI and intelligence integration. Um, there was another misconception about this reorganization we did about four and a half years ago, which uh, that a uh, number of people expressed concern about having only one DDNI for intelligence integration. We somehow de-emphasized the importance of the work being done by support components, including acquisition, technology, facilities, finances, information technology, and resource management. In other words, the, the enterprise dimensions of uh, the intelligence community. And met, but, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, if you weren't in collection and analysis, you weren't, uh, sort of thing. Uh, that is also misconception and, and, uh, and it is completely wrong. And I think we've shown that that uh, wasn't and isn't the case. The work of all of these components uh, enables intelligence integration. And each of them, uh, the staff elements uh, on ODNI promote the culture of integration in each of their respective domains. And I think some of our most impressive accomplishments as an intelligence community have come from these enterprise management uh, realms. I think we, in fact, in the occasion of the 10th anniversary, you had uh, SRA uh, do uh, one of their uh, major issue study approach uh, research on this. You know, to come up with some empirical measures where we could of uh, the progress we think we've made in a whole, whole variety of areas, and it's actually, uh, it's pretty impressive. Um, so acquisition, since Kevin Miners is here. Um, everybody's familiar with the stoplight charts that you use in acquisition management. Um, and so, you know, it's the three basics of cost, schedule, and performance. And if a major system acquisition is on cost, on schedule, and meeting performance goals, it gets a green sticker in each category. Pretty simple. Uh, and if it's falling behind baseline estimates, it gets a yellow sticker. Or if it's really failing, it gets a red sticker. So uh, this, uh, just suffice to say that 10 years ago, we had a very colorful set of charts. 
and they had enough reds and yellows to put an autumn drive through the Shenandoah Mountains to shame. I wasn't going to use that, but my speechwriter, you know, I didn't want to hurt his feelings, but... Uh, <laughs> And there were a lot of failing programs, a very high number of ma major system acquisitions that were uh, so helplessly lost that we had to reset the baseline. We measured their, their, you know, their performance again, and then many of them fell behind the new baseline. But if we look at the numbers over the, the last four years, and again, building on work, hard work, that in the dark days when they had the colorful charts, um, I think we see a vastly, a vastly different picture. Uh, there's, an, I think, an, an order of magnitude difference in our list of programs and whether they're red or yellow. Um, so I think, uh, you know, now, uh, to continue the metaphor here, again, I don't want to hurt his feelings, our stoplight chart is as green as the Pacific Northwest. So, but all to say, it, it does illustrate uh, graphically, I think, the point. Uh, a lot of effort has been devoted to uh, managing major, major systems acquisitions, and we have a lot of them in the IC, and uh, I'm pretty proud of what we've accomplished. And, you know, credit where credit, credit's due, this has uh, been led by uh, our ATNF uh, office. And I think we've seen some tangible results. <clears throat> 2011 and 2012, uh, the NRO completed six major launches in just seven months. Uh, unprecedented uh, achievement and a, certainly a, a major milestone in the history of the IC. IARPA is another organization I like to, I like to highlight. It's, uh, I think, leading a renaissance of technology for the IC, truly doing community research in response to community needs that wasn't possible for it before it stood up in 2007. And I think uh, Haas Cartwright uh, spoke a bit about that earlier. The result of all this is we're realizing really incredible new intelligence capabilities from the new systems we've acquired over the past few years. I don't think that's been uh, shown any more dramatically than after Malaysian, Air Flight, Malaysian Airlines Flight 17 was shot down over uh, the Ukraine uh, this past July. Now, for all of us, this was a terrible, uh, uh, terrible event, terrible tragedy. And it was personal for me because it brought back some very vivid memories from three decades ago. When I was one of two Air Force colonels on the air staff, the other being Rich O'Lear, uh, who led the investigation into the Soviet Union intercepting and shooting down KAL Flight 007 over the Sea of Japan. Um, you know, it is uh, one of the benefits, I guess, of uh, achieving geezerdom and intelligence that, you know, you have the history to draw on a little bit. And I actually saw some similarities between those two uh, tragic events. Similar global outrage, similar efforts by the, by the Soviets at the time and the Russians now to spin and obfuscate what happened. And, and they did the same thing this time as they did 31 years ago. And, in this time, and of course, in this case, in, uh, fabric, including fabricating imagery to try to convey another story. So this has also con conjured up memories of how hard it was to reconstruct what happened to KAL-007. Now, again, acknowledging the difference, KAL-007 went in the Sea of Japan, and you know, uh, the Malaysian airliner came down on land, so that made it a little simpler too. But I think the point I'm trying to make here is the number and variety and diversity of sources we had to draw on where we could really rather quickly put together the story of what happened. And that wasn't the case back in 1983. Um, and so all the work we've done with uh, NTM and the various forms of it that we have today, uh, there was no such thing as social media in 1983. And a lot of other things that we take for granted today, we just didn't have then. Um, so two other graphic examples of, I, I think, of the benefit of intelligence integration, which have occurred more re re uh, re recently. First is the uh, Syrian government's use of chemical weapons against its citizens. And it was because we were able to bring together a very compelling story drawn on many sources of intelligence that, uh, you know, we kind of, I think, delivered some bad news uh, to both the executive branch and, and the Congress that had to be dealt with. 
And similarly, the subsequent dismantling of the Syrian CW uh, capabilities and facilities, uh, which is still go ongoing, heavily, heavily dependent on uh, integrated intelligence uh, support. And that kind of growth and integration success, I think, is happening all across all aspects of the intelligence community, even in places like uh, the Inspector General. Nobody likes to talk about IGs, but I will a little bit here. Um, where the ICIG is now leading teams from multiple agencies and looking at community challenges. And that IGs are now conducting peer reviews of each other's work, which I think is a very, uh, very powerful concept. Uh, so every staff element at ODNI builds on integration. And, um, and of course, that's been true uh, even as we've kind of flipped. Uh, we've transitioned from growing as a community. You know, the first 10, uh, 10 years or so after 9-11, every year we got more money, more people. Um, now we're in a much different mode. Uh, we're not getting more money and more people. And I think there's every prospect in 2016 that we're in for another year of sequestration, so we're going to be doing more cutting. Uh, that's a much different uh, situation that we faced in the 10 years that we mushroomed after 9-11. And of course, uh, the pressure from the budget uh, is not coming at a very opportune time, given uh, the other challenges we've had to deal with, particularly with respect to the ramifications of leaks. And I've spoken to that on the Hill and uh, elsewhere publicly as kind of the, uh, you know, the perfect storm. But uh, I also think, uh, I like to believe this has been a, a litmus test for the position of DNI and ODNI staff. Because it's a lot harder when it comes time to cut things than it is just to add year after year as we were doing. And so I think we've, we've used that opportunity, and I like to think, uh, as a way of uh, strengthening the position and arriving at corporate decisions on what will cut and what we'll protect and what we'll invest in. And that doesn't mean, uh, you know, taxing everybody equally at the office. It means making some conscious judgments about uh, plussing up worthy investments and protecting certain things, notably our people, and then reducing other things. And we're probably going to be, and we're ready for it if we, if we don't get, um, you know, sequestration plus in 2016, and I don't think we will, you know, we'll be prepared for it. So, um, in the summer of, that uh, brings me to uh, one of the things I want to mention here, summer of 2012, of course, and you've all heard me talk about this before, but I'm in the, you know, that's my story, I'm sticking to it mode, uh, just to pick up what uh, Press was talking about. And uh, occasioned by, you know, what we saw on the horizon from a budget standpoint, the big five agency directors, and now we've amended that to include the big six. Because, um, boy, the FBI has really gotten aboard this whole thing with eyesight. And Jim Comey, who's become a personal hero of mine, personally. Um, so we made the decision to try to integrate uh, uh, IC, the IC I, IT enterprise. And of course, you've heard me talk about you know, why we do that. Well, same reason that Willie Sutton uh, Rob Banks, that's where the money was. If we're going to save big money in the intelligence community, it had to be in IT uh, over a period of years. And so it's taken us, uh, you know, things go slow in the government. You all know that. So it's taken us three years to really, I think, lay the foundation for eyesight. And I think now we're in the ad ad adoption mode. You know, the DTE desktops uh, are rolling out 14,000 by last count. I was at FBI last week, did a town hall there, and uh, Eric Velez, who's ter terrific, uh, had four analysts, uh, four young FBI analysts who were part of the FBI pilot for DTE, and they came in and gave me a great briefing on, you know, all the good things about DTE and some of the things we need to fix. It was, it was great. But the FBI does see the merit, see the virtue of this. We have millions of records now in the cloud from the big six agencies and others. Still more to do there. We now have the IC uh, Security Coordination Center, which is trying to watch over our cyber defense, all of which I think, you know, none of this is nirvana, believe me, but it's certainly a tangible process. 
So while we started EyeSight to save money, we're continuing with it because it, it, it promotes integration, improves security, and, and, and sharing all at once. So in essence, EyeSight is kind of the future vehicle for promoting this culture of integration. So um, one of the other things we've learned, of course, from all our hard, hard won experiences the last couple of years is the need for uh, transparency. Um, and probably, uh, even though transparency is a double-edged sword because adversaries take advantage of that transparency, we still have to be, I think, a lot more aggressive than, than we have been. And I think, I think Greg Treverton uh, spoke a bit about that as well uh, this morning. So one of the things we've done in the interest of transparency is published about 5,000 pages of previously classified documents on our Tumblr web website, I see on the record. Uh, many of which, by the way, are kind of critical of, of uh, mistakes we made, including classified court documents that show that the FISA court, which oversees uh, surveillance programs, is not a rubber stamp as it has unfairly and, and inaccurately been portrayed. Now, two years ago, I didn't know what a Tumblr was. Um, this past December, Tumblr featured our site, the IC site, as one of a select few big in 2014 sites for, for their end of year review. And again, uh, we've taken on transparency as uh, an integrated community. So what's all this meant to the IC workforce? Um, starting in 2009, I do, I do think there's a relationship here, the IC has participated in the Federal Workforce Climate Survey. And the, every, every year, the IC has, has rated us as a, a federal best, best place to work. Uh, and every year, we've gone to the Partnership for Public Service Ceremony to pick up our award. I thought that was particularly, uh, I was frankly amazed and pleased, even with all the uh, challenges we've had and criticism and abuse that uh, the IC workforce has taken, that we still did pretty well. Uh, we got some things to work on, of course, but we always do. But in the midst of the leaks, sequestration, mission challenges, furloughs, et cetera, the IC is ranked within the top four places to work in all of government. So we've either been second, third, or fourth, and notably each agency that's ranked higher is significantly smaller than the IC. NASA uh, has held the top spot, lock, has locked it up for the past three years, but we're going we're gonna to push them. That's a reflection of the, of the, and I think what this represents is a reflection of the commitment our workforce has to the IC mission and to the growing feeling of community that we share that national security missions across uh, the IC, including, by the way, the over 11,000 IC employees who have now qualified for joint duty. That's all happened over the past decade of integration. This past fall on Constitution Day, I had a ceremony in which a large number of our ODNI staff chose to renew our oath to the Constitution. I was blown away by the turnout that we had uh, for that ceremony. Before reciting the oath, we were talking about the transformation that had happened since ODNI stand-up. And I told our staff that to me, the big reason why the community has come together and accomplished so many things is because the ODNI leads to that. It promotes it and drives intelligence integration. That's our culture, uh, promoting and fostering uh, that culture throughout the community. And that's something that began a long time before I was sworn in as DNI. And it's something that every office that ODNI contributes to. And uh, this point reminded me of a story from NASA Lore, the very same organization that we're trying to compete with. A story I told to the ODNI staff on that Constitution Day, and I'll, I'll repeat it here today. On September 12, 1962, President Kennedy announced in a speech at Wright's, Rice University that the United States was going, going to put a man on the moon. That was about eight months before I joined the IC with my commission into the Air Force. I met President Kennedy at ROTC summer camp at uh, Otis Air Force Base in Massachusetts just the month before. Anyway, Kennedy told the, st the students and faculty at Rice and the international audience watching on TV, quote, we, chose, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and to 
do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. There's an apocryphal story that sometime in the next few months, President Kennedy visited uh, the NASA Space Center. And he was walking around looking at technology and talking to the uh, NASA workforce. He introduced himself to everyone, not that he needed to, but he met and asked about their work. He talked to NASA's uh, administrators. He talked with the engineers and research scientists. At one point, he turned around and shook hands with a man who served as a janitor in the Space Center. And he said, hi, I'm Jack Kennedy. And he asked, so what do you do? And the janitor answered without hesitation, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. I have no idea if that ever actually happened, but what matters is this. It could have happened. Because NASA in 1962 was focused single-mindedly on that goal, putting a man on the moon. And I told our ODNI workforce that our mission is to lead integration. And if anyone asks what we do, our answer shouldn't be limited to saying, well, we write ICDs, we do cost estimates on NRO programs, which they love, or perform janitorial services. If someone asks what we do in the ODNI, we tell them we lead intelligence integration, because that's what we do. So we renewed our oaths to the Constitution that last fall as a recommitment to the incredibly difficult but always critical work of integrating the intelligence community. You know, I've always admired President Kennedy, especially because he was the president when I joined the intelligence community, and because I had the privilege of meeting and briefly talking with him in person. I like to think, if he was here today, to talk to us about the work that ODI and I and INSA and our IC have undertaken, he would say, we choose to lead intelligence integration not because it's easy, but because it's hard, and because it is critical to our national security. So let me uh, close with that, and let's go to, go to questions. Thank you very much. And press, thank you. Director Clapp, Director Clapp, thank you so much for that presentation. A few questions from our colleagues. What qualities, experience, and temperament would you recommend to the next president in selecting the next DNI? What advice would you give to the next DNI other than to focus on integration? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'll be in assisted living watching. <laughs> well, I think, uh, serious, uh, serious point here, I think, um, you know, whoever uh, becomes president uh, will have, a, have kind of a choice to make, I think, between uh, do you pick uh, someone as DNI who's a, a professional who's been in the business, or do you pick uh, a, a total outsider? And there are upsides and downsides uh, uh, to that. Um, so I think, um, and uh, you know, I guess I would, I'm probably in the camp that says it should be a professional. Uh, that understands uh, the understands the business and importantly the culture uh, of the IC, um, and so I, I hope that uh, I guess the, if I pick one quality, it's uh, one someone who is a is a good leader and has an appreciation for and respect for what really makes the IC work, which is, are its people. Thank you, Director. Second question, the Intelligence Reform Terrorism Prevention Act also mandated some changes in our security clearance process. There have been some ups and downs over the past 10 years, particularly post Snowden. Where are we now with regard to improving and updating our security clearance process? Well, uh, you know, to speak to this for a long time, uh, those of you, any of you who have been involved in this know it is, uh, this is a very hard thing to do. I personally have been working at it for seven or eight years. I began when I got involved in it when I was USDI, and, and uh, David Shedd was another, I don't know if David's still here, but he was very much involved in uh, you know, clearance reform efforts. Um, <clears throat> you know, there were vicissitudes connected with the change of administration. I, I could go into all those war stories, but I won't bore you with it. Suffice to say that the, this is a very, very complex thing to do across the government. There are four key organizations that involved in it that uh, each have a very crucial role to play. That is the Office of Management Budget, the Office of Personnel Management, and DOD for the simple reason that the biggest elephant in the clearance living room is DOD. 
and because of the vast number of clearances are in that one department, and of course, uh, ODI. and And so we've done a lot of what I would call foundational work in terms of consistency, consistent standards across the government, which we did not have, for things like investigators uh, training, certification of investigators, certification and training of, uh, training and certification of um, adjudicators, uh, training curriculum for them, federal investigative standards, these things, not very sexy maybe, but they are, they are crucial to, as, as a, the foundational underpinning for clearances in the government. Uh, this is a very litigious subject, uh, fraught with all kinds of legal implications. So all these things are, are difficult to work in the government, and you just have, you kind of have to recognize that. Obviously, Manning, Snowden uh, sort of gave impetus to this. People got, uh, suddenly got uh, religion about it. And so we've embarked on uh, a number of things, three things I would mention specifically. One thing I've been personally on the war path about is reducing the number of people who have clearances. So we've reduced about three quarters of a million uh, clearances, uh, clearance access, the need for clearance access, for, and we're still working that. It's going to get harder and harder because we've picked off a lot of uh, low-hanging fruit, meaning inaccurate data, inaccurate databases, and this sort of thing. But I think that uh, that ha is hugely important because of the stress it removes from the total system we have for investigating and, and adjudicating. Third, uh, of course, has been, as a result of the leaks, um, focus on changing the system to one of continuous evaluation uh, and that uh, paired with uh, a tandem capability, uh, what, what, what we call insider threat detection. Continuous evaluation, which we will go to, as opposed to the system we have now where you get a clearance when you, you're first cleared, then five years or more later, then you're uh, looked at again. So the objective is the same attributes that we look at at both those intervals would be looked at continuously. The other uh, tandem partner of this is in, inside of threat detection where uh, first and foremost monitoring the electronic behavior of employees uh, to detect uh, potential anomalies. Now, all this will have other benefits. Uh, the, the services are particularly interested in continuous evaluation as a way of preventing other owner, uh, you know, bad behavior, uh, be it uh, threat of suicide uh, or uh, some other um, uh, undesirable behavior that uh, could be precluded or prevented. Now, having said that, uh, I'll make two last comments. One is there is no way that we're ever going to build a mousetrap or a set of mousetraps that will prevent another Manning or Snowden. We're going to have them. The point is, though, to detect such anomalous behavior early, early in the hemorrhage as opposed to late. That, in turn, will serve as, uh, as a deterrent. And the other factor I have become very concerned about is that as we impose all these changes, as we go to uh, inside of th thoroughgoing inside of threat detection, unauthorized uh, behavior monitoring, and continuous evaluation, that we don't create such an oppressive big brother atmosphere in the community that pe people are going to say, you know, I don't think I'll put up with this. So I, we're doing all these things. They're a lot slower than uh, all of us would like. I do think uh, we're making uh, some real headway, real progress here. Right now, we have a very, very committed OMB and OPM and DOD that's, uh, and have done some great things together. Um, and you know, there's, there's more work to be done. But we'll, we'll be working clearance re reform under the, the general rubric for some time to come. Um, but, no, appreciate the question, Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Another question from the audience. Uh, General Clapper, many years ago, you created a briefing called, in quotes, Radical Ruminations, in which you compare the IC to warring parts of Yugoslavia. What model would you use today? Um, well, that's a good point. Yeah, I did compare. Uh, uh, that's true. That. Uh, <laughs> That, that briefing was about vintage uh, 1992. I remember we had an offsite down at uh, Camp Perry, and uh, I used a Herblock cartoon, um, which I have somewhere. 
which uh, showed uh, this, you know, creature, citizen, I guess, looking up at this uh, treehouse that had all kinds of extensions and rooms and two different roofs and chimney and, you know, this monstrosity architecturally. And that was, you know, the, and the, you know, the caption was U U.S. intelligence reform, question mark. I think we are, uh, we have a better constructed house. Um, uh, I don't think there's any, I think the plumbing works better and it's gonna work even better with eyesight. Uh, you know, you stretch a metaphor here. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, uh, these days, what uh, group of nations I would cite. Since in my oral testimony to the SASC, I cited the fact that over half the nations in the world are exhibiting some form of instability. So picking out a country metaphor probably doesn't work so well. Um, I will say that, um, again, I apologize for the historical reference, but uh, when I think back, when I first came in this business in 1963, uh, the, the term integration was never used. It just wasn't uh, part of the lexicon, wasn't part of the culture at all. And so when I look back over 52 years, uh, we've come a long way. Now, most everybody sitting in the audience hadn't had that experience, so all they're concerned about is, uh, you know, impatience with the here and now. And uh, that's a great uh, characteristic of Americans and a great characteristic of the intelligence community is impatience with what's wrong. And so we need to, you know, we need to keep that. Thank you. Another question, Director. In your testimony last week, you called out the, ho the lone wolf threat. You made that very clear. This morning, we heard domestic homeland intelligence is an area for IC improvement. How does the intelligence community bring its capabilities to find the lone wolf? Well, that's a very tough problem. We have cited that uh, consistently in the NIEs that we've done on this subject as, as the probably the most frequent threat we now face is uh, the homegrown violent extremists. This is particularly a critical problem because of the very slick sophisticated uh, capabilities that uh, I, particularly ISIL have demonstrated in their ability to recruit, proselyte, uh, and instill whatever in potential recruits. And the problem here for, for us is, uh, you know, the classical uh, attributes and capabilities of intelligence don't lend themselves to, you know, detection, uh, particularly when it's uh, you know, in, in this country. So this is a very, very tough problem. It, it's gonna involve a lot, I think, in community involvement. Uh, this is one case where, um, and DHS is, is critical to this, is the outreach to state, local, tribal, private sector uh, components. Those 845,000 police departments around this country, uh, the, you know, the front line on the street, uh, that is probably gonna be our best source of INW. And the classic uh, foreign intelligence things that we, we use uh, don't lend themselves to that very well. So this is a, a huge, huge uh, problem for us. One of the things I learned in, uh, when I, was, I traveled to Europe about a month or so ago uh, is <clears throat> the huge importance of not isolating uh, any uh, minority group, uh, certainly in this country, and that's, uh, that's a realization that many uh, European countries are coming to where regrettably Muslim populations are isolated, they're discriminated against, and they become more and more insular and become breeding grounds for extremism. And we need to be sensitive to that uh, in this country. Director, uh, how far down do you see eyesight reaching into the military services? For example, do you see the uh, eyesight, the IC desktop on ships and deployed in Army brigades or forward Air Force bases? It's possible, but I think our big thing right now is just uh, compatibility with the NIP-funded uh, elements in the services. There will have to be a connection, uh, you know, because DOD is so dependent on CIPR, CIPRNET, so how do we make that uh, connectivity? One of the things we've tried to work, uh, Al Tarashik particularly, is uh, trying to stay uh, fairly close at the hip with DOD, at least on the organizing principles of eyesight, so that uh, we're you know we're in the mode of do no harm. Uh, I don't I can't say at this point whether it it will reach down to 
uh, the tactical levels. Um, I think ultimately the tactical levels who particularly require uh, SCI uh, and need SCI support hopefully will, will be connected to ISIT. Director, the last question. You've been very generous with your time. The first panel today gave us the opportunity to hear from your predecessors, their views on the role of the DNI. We heard that very different, different views formulated by these leaders. For example, Admiral uh, Ambassador Negroponte, the IC community manager for the DNI. Vice Admiral McConnell, an IC coordinator, but stated the need to have the DNI elevated to a secretary level. Admiral Blair, in quotes, red meat on the table, an IC leader with authority to select directors. Your views, please. Well, as I said, uh, I, I heard about uh, the commentary made by the prior uh, DNIs and the, their various descriptions of what a DNI needs to be and, and what authorities a DNI needs and all that sort of thing. And I think uh, the, uh, d those descriptions um, apply. Uh, that's kind of a, an all the above proposition, I think. There are certain times when each one of those uh, descriptions uh, applies. Um, so I don't think there's one single uh, um, picture or one single image of what uh, uh, a DNI is. I think it, it's very situational dependent. It's in the end, it's about, uh, I think it's about relationships and, and, and leadership. Uh, you can only legislate so much, uh, all due respect to Michael, uh, as I've said to him, uh, you know, classically, uh, oftentimes a congressional reaction is, for every uh, functional problem nail, the only solution is a legislative sledgehammer. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily true. Uh, IRTPA is, yeah, it's flawed, but most law, big laws are. And you just work, w work within that. And that's why, uh, to me, the important thing is this uh, culture business. That, when it comes down to it, that's, it's, you know, what's, what's your view? What's your word view of how the IC ought to operate? And as I said in my remarks, uh, what we want to get to is where integration is the first default instinctive reaction. Now, that's not something you get done or mandate by close of business next Friday or having a law passed that says the uh, DNI is now a czar or a dictator. Uh, the whole notion, uh, well, I've talked about this before, of having a, you know, a department of intelligence. You know, let's just take all the intelligence things and crash them together. Uh, that may have some appeal, uh, perhaps for an efficiency expert, I suppose, but I think that would be, actually be very destructive to the community. Uh, I don't think it would be accepted by the American public, a juggernaut spy agency or spy department like that. And importantly, I think, let's say for the sake of discussion, we took the agencies whose first letters N out of DOD, DOD would simply regenerate uh, those capabilities, particularly in the SIG and GEO arena, anyway. And so you'd, you wouldn't gain anything. So with all its flaws uh, and inefficiencies and having, you know, it's always uh, interesting to me in my conference room, I, I got 16 logos behind me. And so I have foreign visitors come in, you know, and they look up at that and they roll their eyes and, you know, how does this work sort of thing. Well, it does. Uh, it's, just, it's just the way we are. Enough on that. Director Clapper, we owe you our gratitude for being here today and for your great service to the country and your leadership. Thank you, sir.